Lipstick Traces on a Cigarette. Early in 1953, a teenager named Jean-Michel Méchon turned himself into a living poster and paraded through the streets of Saint-Germain-de-Prés with cryptic slogans. Scrawled up and down his pants, Ed van der Elsken, a young Dutch photographer, stopped the boy and posed him with one Fred, a thug. Today you can just make out the inscriptions, Le International Lettriste ne passera pas, on mentions right leg. Bits of an advertisement for Houlemont en faveur de Sade on his left. Film dynamique and something about lots of girls. A few days later, Minchin and Fred got drunk, streaked their hair with peroxide and stumbled through the quarter, slapping female shoppers and picking fights with businessmen. They were beaten to the pavement where the police found them and took them to jail. About the same time, new graffiti began to appear on the walls of the neighborhood. Let us live. The ether is for sale for nothing. Long live the ephemeral. Free the passions. Never work. New, my eye, anyone on the left bank might have said, it was old-time surrealism and a crude imitation at that, but the crudity was the point. The Surrealists had first launched such slogans in the 1920s when revolution seemed inevitable. In the early 1950s when revolution seemed impossible, the words were barely language at all. They made an inversion. The poor phrases were so primitively Surrealist, they were pre-Surrealist. They said that Surrealism had never happened, that everything remained to be invented from the beginning. All those who attempt to situate themselves after Surrealism, read the first article in the first number of International Situation East, June 1958, once again discover questions which predate it. In the Cabaret Voltaire, as Raoul Benajem would tell the story in the revolution of everyday life, nothing, not the war, not the way you placed your beer glass on the table, stayed the same. Everything was transformed. That was the situation the Lettrist International set out to construct, but not in a cabaret. Thus, it began with living posters beating up people in the street. Quote, the only modern phenomena comparable to Dada are the most savage outbreaks of juvenile delinquency, end of quote, Benajem said. He thought the role of the Situationist International was to apply, quote, the violence of the delinquents on the plane of ideas, end of quote. The Lettrist International began by applying its ideas on the plane of delinquency, running down the street in slogans, taking aim at the unconscious agents of the spectacle commodity economy. It must have seemed like an idea at that time. The L.I. did have an idea, a new idea in Europe, it titled a manifesto on 3 August 1954, reaching back for the phrase St. Just coined as he reported to the Convention of the Revolution on 13 Ventos, year 2, 3 March 1794. Happiness is a new idea in Europe, said St. Just. Leisure, said Michel I. Bernstein, Andre Frank Connard, Mohamed Dahu, Guy Ernest de Borde, Jacques Fillon. Vera and Gil J. Woolman in the seventh number of the L.I. Bulletin Potlatch is the real revolutionary question. In any case, economic prohibitions and their moral corollaries will soon be completely destroyed and superseded. The organization of leisure, the organization of the freedom of a multitude, a little less driven to continuous work, is already a necessity for capitalist states just as it is for their Marxist successors. Everywhere, one is limited to the obligatory degradation of stadiums or television programs. It is above all for this reason that we must denounce the immoral condition imposed upon us, this state of poverty. Having spent a few years doing nothing in the common sense of the term, we can speak of our social attitude as avant-garde, because in a society still provisionally based in production, we have sought to devote ourselves seriously only to leisure. 
If this question is not openly posed before the collapse of current economic development, change will be no more than a bad joke. The new society, which once again takes up the goals of the old society without having recognized and imposed a new desire, that is the truly utopian tendency of socialism. Only one task seems to us worth considering, the perfecting of a complete divertisement. More than one to whom adventures happen, the adventurer is one who makes them happen. The construction of situations will be the continuous realization of a great game, a game the players have chosen to play, a shifting of settings and conflicts to kill off the characters in a tragedy in 24 hours. But time to live will no longer be lacking. Such a synthesis will have to bring together a critique of behavior, a compelling town planning, a mastery of ambiances and relationships. We know the first principles. The L.I.'s theory of anti-economics was followed on the page by the best news of the week, a regular potlatch feature. Washington, D.C., July 29th, A.P., in a search delivered to a religious convention, Mr. Richard Nixon, the Vice President of the United States, declared that he believed those who imagined a full bowl of rice could prevent the people of Asia from turning toward communism were gravely deluding themselves. Let me reread that. Washington, D.C., July 29th, Associated Press. In a speech delivered to a religious convention, Mr. Richard Nixon Mr. Richard Nixon, the Vice President of the United States, declared that he believed those who imagined a full bowl of rice could prevent the people of Asia from turning toward communism were gravely deluding themselves. Economic well-being is important, continued the Vice President, but to claim that we can win the people of Asia to our side simply by raising their standard of living is a lie and a slander. This is a proud people with a great record behind them. Thus did Richard Nixon add his voice to the growing lecherist international chorus. Armed with its theory, the L.I. had a practice. Writing to Jean-Louis Brau in the spring of 1953, Woolman summed it up. Where were we when you left? Joel has been out of jail for some time. Parole. Freedom, too, for Jean-Michel and Fred. And for speeding, under the influence, of course. Little Eliane came out last week after a dramatic arrest in a maid's room somewhere in Vincennes. She was with Joel and Jean-Michel, need I say they were drunk, who refused to open the door for the police, who called in reinforcements. In the confusion, they lost the L.I. seal. Linda, did, Linda not yet tried. Sarah's still in jail, but her sister, 16 and a half, took her place with us. There have been more arrests for drugs, for who knows what. It's getting boring. Then there is G.E., who spent 10 days in a sanitarium where his parents sent him after he tried to asphyxiate himself. He's back now. Serge will get out of jail May 12th. The day before yesterday, I threw up in Manos. The latest amusement in the quarter is to spend the night in the catacombs, another one of Joel's bright ideas. This, the members of the L.I. tried to convince themselves, was a rehearsal for the revolution they had promised each other to make, the supersession of art and the end of work, a shifting of settings and conflicts that would kill off the characters in a tragedy and bring real people to life, the first revolution, the L.I. told itself, consciously based not in a critique of suffering in the dominant society, but in a, quote, total critique of its idea of happiness. A critique in acts, a new performance of everyday life. Happiness was still a new idea in Europe, 160 years after St. Just heard himself condemned as a traitor to the revolution, after he voice of the new man stood silent as he was driven overnight from the Committee of Public Safety to the guillotine. Since then, 
all official revolutions had rested their case, not on happiness, but on justice. And on that rock they had broken to pieces or turned to stone. But weren't all true revolutionaries driven by the desire for happiness, as Ivan Cheglov said for the L.I. in his formula for a new urbanism? by a lust for a world in which it would be impossible not to fall in love. They had been embarrassed to admit it. Those few instance, instances in which they did admit it were expunged from the official record. What matters, what matters my happiness against the multitude crying for food and clothing? It matters not, said the owners of the revolutionary tradition taking up residence in the catacombs of visible culture. The L.I. stumbled on a notion and went back to the free spirit. Quote, my happiness ought to justify existence itself, end of quote. So did the opposed first principles of justice and happiness turn into one. That, the L.I. thought, was what St. Just was talking about. <clears throat> Born, born in 1767, executed in 1794, Louis Antoine de Saint-Just was the prophet of the Republic of Virtue. Of a virtue dormant in every human heart, suppressed and twisted by the masters of the old world, which had to be drawn out of each new citizen or enforced. Recognizing a new desire for happiness, for a moment Saint-Just had the power to impose it. The words with which he followed a new idea in Europe were, I propose to you the following decree. He spoke on the stage of world history, one foot in Paris and the other in Sparta. He spoke to Lycurgus and Lysithucides, to Lenin and Pol Pot, and he knew they would hear what he said. The L.I. spoke in a bar that sold franchise and solace along with beer and wine. Cafe, Cafe, Megalom Cafe Megalomania, the Berlin Dadaists had called their version of the place. There the L.I. tried to recapture St. Just's tone of voice. And it was hard to catch, austere and ecstatic, furious and still, the tone of the cryptic slogan, The mind is a sophist who leads virtue to the scaffold. <laughs> you could puzzle that out for days, or you could look at St. Just's face, at busts and engravings. But like the young man himself, when his time was up, they said nothing. If one portrait was cold, all hard cheekbones and hooded eyes, the next was soft, the cheeks full and smooth, the eyes innocent. Quote, to tell the truth, the only reason one fights is for what one loves, end of quote, said the philosopher of the terror. Quote, fighting for everyone else is only the consequence, end of quote. Shredding that fucking piano. Get it. Thank you. 
The L.I. <clears throat> Eliane Bra wrote in 1968 as Eliane Papai, she was the little Eliane of Woolman's letter, was, quote, auto-terrorist, end of quote. The group demanded that one practice terrorism on oneself, quote, a self-educational process, end of quote, Raoul Hausman said of the psychology of the Berlin Dada Club. <clears throat> <clears throat> in which routine and conventions have to be ruthlessly wiped out. The L.I. worked hardest to maintain the conviction that nothing was more important, and so every person found unworthy of the game was excluded from it. <clears throat> St. Just, in whose ideal society banishment was to be the ultimate sanction, would have approved. Officially, the first to be removed were Isadora Isso, Gabriel Pomerand, and Maurice Lemaitre, who had never been present, claiming rights to the words lettrist and lettrism after the Chaplin incident. The L.I. incorporated the founders only to expel them as traitors to their own ideas. And then in the year between Woolman's letter to Brow and, quote, a new idea in Europe, end of quote, Brow himself, militarist, read the second number of Potlatch, Serge Berna, lack of intellectual rigor, the emblazoned dimension, merely decorative, and even the visionary Chegloff, mythomania, delirium, lack of revolutionary consciousness. Quote, it's pointless to hark back to the dead, end of quote, Woolman wrote to seal the Allies' first execution list. As in certain fundamentalist sects, those who remained within the group were never to speak to any who had been shut out or even of them. But de Borde did in 1978 in his film In Jerem Imus Nocte et Consumum or Igni, matching a picture of Cheglov to a blind quotation. Debord read it on the soundtrack. Quote, How many times through the ages will the sublime drama we are creating be performed in unknown tongues before an audience which is yet to be? <clears throat> years had burdened the words with irony, but they still held real wonder, tracing the theme. The board put a comic strip panel on the screen. The Knights of Prince Valiant in Search of Adventures read the title. He advances near the mysterious gleam which lights up the place where nothing human has ever been found. Then Cheglov reappeared, and de Borde spoke for himself. It is said that merely by subjecting life in the city to his gaze, he changed them, and one year he discovered the subjects of vengeance for a century. That discovery was the Allies' drama. The board was saying, and those subjects of vengeance, its legacy. It is this expressive contradiction between nihilist acts so puerile as to cut themselves off from any philosophical justification, and a voice so classically sentimental it could ennoble the most puerile act, between a found ancestry carrying seeds of totalitarianism and mass murder and a will to a negation containing, quote, no promise other than that of an autonomy without rules and without restraint. End of quote. De Borde in Jira. That defined the Lettrist International. In a conversation that moves from the Cabaret Voltaire to the Sex Pistols, the L.I. is a culmination of the first side of the story and a source of the second. More vitally, the L.I. frames the possibility that each actor might speak the language of every other.
going to interrupt this reading of Lipstick Traces on a Cigarette to read from The Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis from the uh, 15th century, just for fun, just to break things up. The Inward Conversation of Christ with the Faithful Soul. I will hear what the Lord God will speak in me. Blessed is the soul who hears the Lord speaking within her, who receives the word of consolation from his lips. Blessed are the ears that catch the accents of divine whispering and pay no heed to the murmurings of this world. Blessed indeed are the ears that listen, not to the voice which sounds without, but the, to the truth which teaches within. Blessed are the eyes which are closed to exterior things and are fixed upon those which are interior. Blessed are they who penetrate inwardly, who try daily to prepare themselves more and more to understand mysteries. Blessed are they who long to give their time to God and who cut themselves off from the hindrances of the world. I have to interrupt this reading for a second and say, isn't this kind of like what the guy was saying about auto-terrorism, self -terror, like, but in a, in a peaceful way, like, you know, like, uh, 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 like going within, but in a quiet way. Consider these things, my soul, and close the door of your senses so that you can hear what the Lord your God speaks within you. I am your salvation, says your beloved. I am your peace and your life. Remain with me and you will find peace. Dismiss all passing things and seek the eternal. What are all temporal things but snares? And what help will all creatures be able to give you if you are deserted by the Creator? Leave all these things, therefore, and make yourself pleasing and faithful to your Creator so that you may attain to true happiness. Herein ends the six centuries old commercial for Jesus. And we go back to lipstick traces. In this story, the L.I. is ground zero, a vessel both empty and full. The L.I. had a seal which represented history and which before it was lost in a drunken moment, the group meant to apply to what philosophy it might derive from joy rides and nights and spent in underground tombs. At the same time, the L.I. damned all those who believed in, quote, leaving traces, end of quote, and it left few enough. In five years, less than three dozen skimpy newsletters, a clutch of fugitive essays, various renderings of De Tourment, some telephone pole stickers, a slogan scratched on a wall. One can add a small pile of memoirs, Debord's sandpaper-covered collage book, his films on the passage of a few people through a rather brief moment in time, 1959, and Injirum and Michelle Bernstein's novels, Tous les Chevaux du Roux, All the King's Heroes, 1960, and La Nuit, 1961. Queer memoirs, because while each cast back to the L.I. for subject or setting, None ever mentioned it. Here's a quote in the margin from Guy Vanderhaeg, My Present Age, 1985. Writing that made me feel cheerier. There is no better antidote for the terrible feeling of powerlessness which clutches modern day, modern man by the throat than a vigorous exercise of the imagination. 
It is the allurements of the imagination which has allowed all those ragtag guerrilla movements of the last 30 years to succeed. That and the will to endure for the sake of the future. It is only the lack of the latter that has prevented me from accomplishing great things in my own right. End of quote. In a way that is fitting, because it truly was a void the band had meant to conjure up, the L.I.'s unlikely project was to do nothing and yet maintain itself. Thus, its most tangible accomplishment was to persist from 1952 to 1957. When those few who were left, those who, as Bernstein, Bernstein put it in 1983, had somehow refrained from placing their wine glasses on the table in a bourgeois manner... <laughs> Again, in a way that is in a way that is fitting because it truly was a void the band had meant to conjure up. The Allies' unlikely project was to do nothing and yet maintain itself. Thus, its most tangible accomplishment was to persist from 1952 to 1957, when those few who were left, those who, as Bernstein put it in 1983, had somehow refrained from placing quote their wine glasses on the table in a bourgeois manner end of quote, joined with others. Working artists, older and far more notable than the Lollard intellectuals of the L.I., to form the Situationist International. <clears throat> As an organization that from 1958 to 1969 made unique public sense of great public events, and with the revolt of May 68 even shaped them, the S.I. dwarfs the L.I., even if the L.I. holds a deeper story. The fable behind the tale the S.I. told as fact. There was an absolutism in the L.I. the primitivism of the group conceals, but this is why DeBoer justified the L.I.'s dissolution into the impressive new federation with an argument titled One Step Back. Quote, what we did can be put on the table. What we did was what we wrote, end of quote, Bernstein says of the S.I., Still, the violent glamour of what the SI wrote, its spectacular authority, conceals the primitivism of the SI itself. Because the SI worked to make its critique public while ensuring that its authors remained obscure, because its members, sometimes as many as 20, sometimes as in early 1968, less than a dozen, found a tone that let them speak as tribunes of an invisible empire. The group became mythical almost before it began and remained spectral even in its most public moments. This is why its history whether recorded in punk fans, fanzines or academic journals, is full of myth, of accounts of street theater and symbolic ursprunges, of public pranks on the level of the intervention in Notre Dame. As attributed to the SI, the events are fictions, but they were also real. Made first in miniature and in secret by the LI and then on stages of world history, albeit stages built in a day and taken down almost as quickly, <clears throat> by the SI's readers, its fans, or its inheritors. That is because the spirit of such events, the Allies' wish for them not as interventions but as foundings, went into what the Situationists wrote. And that spirit, as a totality, altogether absent in any other voice of the time, was at once enraged and playful, critical and willful, desperate and happy. Ours is the best effort so far to get out of the 20th century. Hey, 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 bump, bump, 
Hey, hey.